industry. She also has Lodge Mall Consulting for Creatives, and Diana is also a professor at Georgia State University, and she's on council with Berman St. Van Horn. She's a busy lady, but she's taking time to join us today. This program is always one of our most popular, the top 50 plus cases. No, she's not gonna go through all 50, just so you know. But uh, she is going to point out the most important, and then we're going to go have some uh, uh, refreshments. So there you go, Diana. Please welcome Diana to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Stephen and Marilyn and Jessica. It's, it's great to be back amongst the world and hospitality of all. Uh, my husband and I, when I told my husband that I was going to come to D.C. for this conference, he said, let's drive. Uh, drive? Well, I live in Atlanta, by the way, so it's about an eight, nine hour drive. So I thought, okay, well, we like each other, so I thought, <laughs> okay. So he said, yeah, it's a perfect time of year because the leaves are changing and it looks so gorgeous, and they haven't really started to change much in, in Georgia. So as we were driving up, we were looking at the colors and just really enjoying it, and said, you know, we really do like fall. It's, and October is wonderful because because of Halloween, we've got Halloween coming at the end of the month. So, but there's just something I have to share with you. There's one thing that I just don't like about Halloween, which is, Thank you for it. Oh my God, I'm gonna write too late. Witches, 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 witches. <laughs> witches. Did you get out? Oh my gosh. Thank you, Stephen. He's kind of laughing like witches. 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 Ended up, um, and I do have ADA cases, I have franchise cases, I have a bunch of other stuff. And there has been so much going on, there's so many really cool cases. Are they getting the copy of the paper as yeah. well as the, okay. Yeah. So there's 50 plus, I never, we never would really stick to that number when we had 100. But there's 50 plus cases that are, and there's so many more. I tried to do as many federal cases so that they would apply to more folks than just the, the local um, state laws. But, um, what, what we've got here is just ones that I thought were the most interesting in the short time period that we have. And Karen's not here. And hi, Karen, if you're listening, you're going to hear this. And I'm going to give a shout out to her because she was helpful in putting this all together as well. But there's been um, some really interesting cases. Some of them are pandemic related. You'll find some of those in the, in the hard copy of, of that. But I wanted to share a couple of uh, ones I found were more, more interesting that would be good for the presentation. Okay. You know, it's hard for people to see that, but I mean, what's a presentation without a PowerPoint, right? And they say if you use a PowerPoint, you have me in a room. Oh my gosh, you never use a PowerPoint. Oh. See, that's why you go first in the answer. I got it, right? They're not going to like, what's a PowerPoint, right? Okay. So, this first case, yeah, okay, see you. This was heard in the U.S. District Court in Southern California just this past May. Uh, the plaintiff was from Casa Grande, Arizona, and the defendant, SeaWorld, obviously, was over in St. Louis in San Diego. And it's about 350 to 450 miles apart, roughly, depending on if you use weights or maps or however you decide to go. The plaintiff in this case was a 61-year-old wheelchair-bound guest who stayed at the hotel in July of 2021. But he saw that the hotel was not compliant with the ADA, nor with the state law. But my presentation is going to focus mainly on the federal part, the ADA. He claimed that the hotel's access aisle was too steep and does not connect to the accessible route, denying him equal access to the hotel. He also said he never intended to return to the hotel, which is critical for this case. Um, but he said he wouldn't come back because the hotel is just not fully compliant with the ADA or the state laws. The plaintiff wanted an injunction requiring the hotel to comply with the laws, uh, which is the relief that's available under the ADA. Um, and he asked for damages of $4,000 per violation. The hotel 
argued that the plaintiff lacked standing because he did not intend to return to the hotel um, because he failed to allege in his pleadings that he was going to return to the hotel. So the court said that the plaintiff lacked standing. And with that, with, and with that, the court lacked subject matter jurisdiction over this ADA claim. And so they had to dismiss it. Then the court said, even if the plaintiff cures this basic pleading deficiency by going ahead and resubmitting his pleadings, he'll still have to show his intent to return. And since he's in Arizona and the hotel's in California, his intent would have to be genuine. The plaintiff didn't give the court a reason why he would return to San Diego or if he would stay at the defendant's hotel over any other hotels in that area. The plaintiff said that even if he had not shown an intent to return, he may still show what's known as tester standing. Are y'all familiar with tester standing? Yeah. So over the years, a lot of people have been, uh, some of these advocacy groups, et cetera, have been filing these cookie cutter lawsuits or drive-by lawsuits, they'll call them, where if they see that a hotel or a public accommodation is not in compliance, just by seeing it, they'll file these suits. Um, so that's what they, they were calling tester standing, but this court said even if they were, uh, even if he was in that, uh, that classification of a tester standing, that that would not fly with this court. Um, things such as prior visits, how close the hotel is to the plaintiff's residence, his plans for future visits, that's what counts. The court also went on to discuss the ADA claims of the three elements that were necessary, uh, physical or mental impairment, that substantially limits one or more life activity, and in this case, the plaintiff was missing a leg, the defendant's hotel is a place of public accommodation, so check, we got that one too. And he says he was denied access due to a prohibited architectural barrier due to the steepness of this ramp. But here's the thing that we talked about earlier, the plaintiff failed to state that removal of the barriers is readily achievable because it was a, you know, it was just a, a ramp kind of thing, of asphalt. The court granted the defendant's motion to dismiss but allowed 30 days to, for them, them to fix the pleadings. And of course, this just happened this past May, so we don't know what, what's happened just yet on that. So that was one of the cases I thought was kind of interesting. Um, Can I just say, this is one of these guys that's brought up thousands of lawsuits. Yes. Have you been on the defense side of it against them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's ridiculous. Most of these plaintiffs have burned, and then they just allege, oh, I'm coming back next year. Yeah. For whatever reason, he hasn't. Yeah. He keeps on losing these cases. I don't understand it. Yeah. This is something to talk about, too. <laughs> okay, the next case is an arbitration case, and this one was decided in March of this year in the Supreme Court of Bronx County, New York. On October 27th of 2020, the plaintiff, in this case, was slashed and stabbed while within the hotel premises that were owned, operated, and maintained by one of the defendants. The plaintiff alleged negligent maintenance of the defendant's 225 Bowery LLC hotel and failure to provide adequate security. There's also a claim in there that the defendant was negligent in the hiring and training of security officers for the hotel. The defendant, Ace, uh, filed an answer which included a cross-claim against the other defendant, Bowery, as well as some other affirmative defenses. And Ace at the time was the manager of the hotel. And the manager of the hotel relied on an indemnification provision in the hotel management agreement that Ace entered into with Bowery's predecessor. And Ace alleged that on March 20th, 2020, so this was several months before the incident occurred, Bowery shut down the hotel due to the pandemic and entered into an agreement with the New York City Department of Homeless Services to repurpose the hotel into a homeless shelter. And then as of June 4th, Ace was barred from managing the hotel. And Ace argued it had no control over that hotel when this gentleman was stabbed, the plaintiff, and therefore was not responsible for those injuries. Under the management agreement, Ace was to procure a commercial liability policy, but failed to do so. So technically, Ace was allegedly in breach of the agreement, but the defendant, Barry, was seeking an indemnification from the defendant, Ace, as the plaintiff's injuries says Ace was in breach of the management agreement by not providing that policy, that coverage. Ace decides to arbitrate these claims due to, under the provisions of the hotel management agreement um, uh, and then Ace has claims against Bowery for terminating the agreement and turning the hotel into a homeless shelter. And at that time, they terminated all of Ace's employees and turned it into an Airbnb. The defendant, Ace, initiated arbitration, but Bowery, trying to convince the court that there these cross claims back and forth, 
was really a tantamount to a, a waiver of the obligation to arbitrate that was in the hotel management agreement. And so the, the Bowery wanted to arbitrate. Uh, well, actually, Ace wanted to arbitrate. Bowery said, no, no, we're already in court. Let's do this. The court held that even though the parties may agree to waive arbitration, there's no evidence of the relinquishment of a known right or an intention to abandon the right to arbitrate. A court looks at the amount of litigation that's ha that has already happened, the length of time between the start of the litigation and then this arbitration request, and whether prejudice has been established. It really focused in on that point. The court said that the key to the waiver analysis is prejudice, and it's really up to the degree of participation um, or the clear manifestation of a preference to litigate as opposed to arbitrate. And if the claims are different, that can be another factor that the court looks at. And in this case, the court ruled that the defendant Ace's cross claims and other claims by Bowery are likely to be dispositive of several of the claims in the litigation. So the court ruled that to avoid an inconsistent resolution, the court decided to stay the litigation until the conclusion of the arbitration claims. So this is a really good case if you're in the middle of a discussion about arbitration versus litigation. It gives you some, uh, some background and some case law and things that, that might be of some help to you. I know this was a New York State case, but it might be of some help in, in defending or trying to move forward in a particular way. Okay. All right, so this case is about attorney fees. And it was brought in the federal court in the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of New York. It was decided in March of this year. This case involved an ADA claim where the plaintiff claimed that ADA was, uh, was violated by failing to provide a detailed description of its hotel facilities available to guests with disabilities on its website. It's very key to what we were talking about earlier. The complaint was served and the defendant didn't answer. So a default judgment was entered and the plaintiff sought an injunction and attorney fees. So this case is gonna focus on the attorney fees part of it. The court granted the injunction, but the court found that the plaintiff had not provided sufficient documentation to determine whether the fees and the costs sought were reasonable. Well, the plaintiff's counsel sought attorney fees calculated at $425 an hour, and said he spent 12 and a half, close to 12 and a half hours working on the case for a grand total of $5,270. Remember, this is a default judgment case, too. The party who wins, who, who wins bears the burden of demonstrating that the request to be is reasonable. The court went into a lengthy discussion about, well, how, does they, how do they determine reasonableness? They look at the time and the labor required, the novelty and the difficulty of the legal questions, the skill required to perform the legal services, the work the attorney had to forbear due to accepting this particular client, the customary fees, whether the fees uh, fixed or contingent, what kind of time limitations might be imposed, the amount involved, experience, reputation, and ability of the attorney. Uh, they go into a litany of things. Um, if requesting fees for an out-of-district counsel, the court will also look to see why can't a local counsel uh, be the one. And so let's look at those fees. After applying the factors that I just mentioned, the court found that the case may have been fairly complicated to initiate, but the case ended up being decidedly simple to litigate. So the court found that the fee request was unreasonable and applied the appropriate local fee of $350 an hour. So instead of getting this $52.70, he ended up with $43.40. So there's some guidance there if you're wondering if your fees are reasonable. Okay. All right, this case um, was heard in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. I have other cases besides New York, too. It was decided on April of last year, 2021. This is an interesting case where the plaintiff's attorney uh, appeared incompetent and the court is on the plaintiff's, the court is on to the plaintiff's attempts to avoid responsibility. They, the court's seeing all this very clearly. The plaintiff's a 70 year old non-union stewarding manager, who by the way started as a dishwasher and earned promotions to stewarding manager and then purchasing manager. Then he took medical leave from his job due to some sort of internal bleeding issues. When he attempted to turn to work, the doctor imposed some restrictions on his impact uh, for his job, and then he saw an additional leave time, which the hotel granted. His request was approved, and he took an additional 12 weeks, so he had 24 weeks of leave. Before his extended leave was up, his doctor said he could come back to work, but he still had some limitations. The hotel wasn't real sure how much this person could do, so they asked the plaintiff to undergo a more extensive medical evaluation 
which the plaintiff, uh, which said the plaintiff could return to work with some accommodations. He couldn't lift the 50 pounds as required by the essential elements of the job, his job description, and could not walk for more than 30 minutes at a time. While he was on leave, Hilton Management Company, here we go again, Hilton, okay? Hilton Management Company undertook negotiations to acquire Millennium, the hotel. Per the negotiations, Millennium was required to terminate all non-union employees. The hotel then terminated the plaintiff. Plaintiff sued, claiming age and dis disability discrimination. He said in his deposition in his role, he didn't have to stand for long hours or to lift more than 50 pounds. The hotel alleged plaintiff's position had been eliminated and had been unoccupied for 24 weeks without any adverse impact on the hotel. Brian, that's kind of like what we talked about at lunch. In essence, the hotel didn't really need him. The hotel moved for summary judgment, claiming the plaintiff was terminated for non-discriminatory reasons, and the court granted the defendant's motion. Now, I mentioned earlier that the court was on to the plaintiff, plaintiff's counsel's behavior. His counsel failed to timely file a deposition or rap sheet, arguing that 30 days to provide the deposition changes does not include holidays, and the court said, consistent with his deficient performance throughout this entire litigation, the plaintiff's counsel, his failure to count days accurately contradicts his audacious claim that he is an extremely careful attorney who strives to adhere to deadlines. And throughout this, this, or this um, opinion, there's a lot of digs on this plaintiff's counsel. The judge really didn't care for him. The court said the attorney failed to act numerous times and to meet deadlines and didn't provide any extenuating circumstances beyond, quote, bonehead deflections. The defendant offered up a list of nine potential millennium witnesses, and plaintiff's counsel didn't oppose all of them, claiming he cannot be reasonably expected to depose more than two witnesses. And the court said, the court cannot overstate the extent to which plaintiff's counsel's argument boggles the mind. And you know what else boggles my mind? That Texas Pete lawsuit. Did you hear about that? Texas, somebody in California is suing Texas Pete. And I saw this on the internet, so I know it's real. <laughs> because Texas Pete is made in North Carolina, and this person thought it was made in Texas. And it's very upset because it shouldn't be made in North Carolina, it should be made in Texas, because Texas is the best state ever, right? Yeah. But he wouldn't use it. He wouldn't use it if he had known it was made in Texas. He would have spent all that money, too, if he had known that it was. Exactly. So that boggles my mind. But anyway, I don't know if that's gonna, what's going to happen with that one. Just a side note. <laughs> All right, next case. All right. So the reason why I chose these slides is that this person and this, and this employee just doesn't follow the rules. So I thought this was a good example of that. This case um, was uh, uh, rose at the um, U.S. District Court located in Utah and was decided in January of this year. The plaintiff began working at the Little America Hotel in the year 2000 as a server and eventually worked up as a salesperson in the hotel's fine gift store. For 16 years, the plaintiff reported to the retail department manager, Ms. Fryer, who noted various problems with the plaintiff and her coworkers. The plaintiff allegedly had negative work behavior such as parking on the hotel parking lot, which she's not supposed to, speaking in a foreign language, she spoke Russian, under which company policy said she's not permitted to do so. She was always on the phone, she hung up on her boss, and she broke various rules. She was just not a very compliant person. For the last two years before the plaintiff was terminated, she had a new boss who also was aware of the plaintiff's feeling of entitlement that the rules don't apply to her. The hotel general manager and the hotel resident manager became involved in coaching the plaintiff and an incident arose as to a commission on a sale that was due a coworker and not given to her in violation of the company policies. When she was confronted, the plaintiff went to the CEO's office to discuss her disagreement, and the CEO said for her to talk to HR. Then the plaintiff wanted the owner's cell phone number to discuss this matter, and HR made it clear that that was inappropriate to call the owner, but she didn't want to follow the rules. Other issues came to light when the plaintiff allegedly threatened a coworker Co-workers were complaining about plaintiff's toxic behavior and the plaintiff's behavior in the workplace had to change or else. Uh, therefore, the plaintiff was terminated based on her constant and repetitive insubordination, so she sued for national origin discrimination and retaliation. 
The plaintiff didn't offer any evidence at all of knowledge of anyone at the hotel saying anything derogatory about Russia or Russians. I don't know when was this uh, last year. Okay. <laughs> the court found that there was no evidence shown by plaintiff that gives, that gives rise to an inference of national origin discrimination, and the hotel provided legitimate, non-discriminatory reasons for the termination. So again, you want to document everything and make your have everything ready to go if cases like these come across your desk. Okay. Pregnancy discrimination. Isn't that a great picture? That's the most fun about putting this together is these photos and so. All right. So this is a federal case that was decided January of this year in New York. Okay. So plaintiff is a 43-year-old, 43-year-old resident of New York, and she was the C COO, the chief operating officer of the Front Street Hotel in New York. She began working for the defendants in 2007 and worked for 13 years. Her supervisor actually lived in Spain, but she got very, very close with her because she would travel back and forth. Her supervisor told her in confidence that she hated her friends when they became pregnant. In December of 2019, the plaintiff told the supervisor that she was going to start IVF treatment as she wanted a child and, um, and that was the only option to become pregnant because at that time she was 41. Her supervisor told her that the owner and the CEO of the hotel didn't like people taking leave because it ends up costing the company a lot of money. The plaintiff told her supervisor that she began treatments for IVF on January 30th of 2020, and also shared with her supervisor that 21 days later, on February 20th, she found out she was pregnant. Wow, I've never heard of that happening so quickly. Five days later, on February 25th, after sharing her news, with her supervisor, she received a letter signed by her employer, which didn't provide any basis for termination, and no oral explanation was provided. They said, you're out. The plaintiff claimed she had never received any bad reviews or warnings during her 13-year career, and that her record was impeccable. The opinions of the court speaks to various ancillary issues, such as subject matter and personal jurisdiction, as well as joint employer issues, but I wanted to focus on the pregnancy discrimination claim. The defendants filed a motion to dismiss, and the court said, the short temporal proximity between the time plaintiff disclosed her pregnancy and her termination, which was five days, more than suffices to establish an inference of unlawful discrimination. So the defendant's motion to dismiss was denied. And if you go to EEOC.gov and look up the type of claims that are happening, I always like to look at the title of the news articles that are on there. There are so many pregnancy discrimination claims that are out there. Even just October 3rd of this year, September 29th, September 28th. I mean, it's just crazy, all these pregnancy discrimination claims. So let's don't do that anymore. That's my advice. Okay. Next one, religious, religious discrimination. This case was heard by the uh, U.S. District Court in the Southern District of New York and was decided on February 16th uh, of this year. The plaintiff was a manager, um, and that was the plaintiff, a manager of the defendant's restaurant, sued the restaurant and the owners alleging sex-based discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. The plaintiff alleged that defendants retaliated against her by filing frivolous lawsuits in response to her decision to seek enforcement and relief through the EEOC. She also added a claim for discrimination based on religion. Her religious claim was based on a single incident in which the owner of the restaurant threw the plaintiff's Bible in the garbage and told her it was bad luck. I was shocked to find a picture of that actually showed. <laughs> the court held this one incident was insufficient to establish a prima facie, prima facie case for a hostile work environment based on religious discrimination, and so that portion of the complaint was dismissed. <clears throat> and in addition, the court dismissed the claims Title VII claims against individual owners of the business because Title VII does not create a cause of action against individual defendants. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one incident's not going to be good. All right, next case is about the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, it has to do with whether or not a service charge and a tip, you know, whether you can use those against the uh, minimum wage requirement. This case, not a New York case, was heard by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals for the Southern District of Florida and was decided on July 13th of this year. The plaintiff worked as a server at this restaurant called Samba, 
the Sonic, which is located in a hotel on Miami Beach. She claimed the defendant did not comply with the FLSA, arguing that any wages tied to a service charge were really derived from an unlawful tip pool that was shared with her managers, and that she was underpaid, arguing that the minimum wage requirement could not be satisfied by amounts generated through a service charge, she guessed. The FLSA requires that an employer pay at least $7.25 an hour to its employees, and in Florida, the minimum wage was $8.46 per hour. And in this case, the plaintiff actually made about $21.67 per hour. She was making a lot more than minimum wage. Um, she didn't dispute that part. The restaurant's menu said that the restaurant imposes an automatic, non-discretionary service charge of 20% on every customer's bill. Management was allowed to waive this charge if the customer complained about it, so the plaintiff argued that it really wasn't a mandatory payment. The court said that even if the service charge is removed by management, it's not the customer who decides, but it's the management that does. The court also said that one of the critical features of a tip is when given, it's solely determined by the customer, not the restaurant. Does anybody know what TIPS stands for, that acronym? T-I-P-S? Historically, to improve proper service, but I don't know what that's really true. That's to ensure prompt service. That's what I see. Now, you think something talks about it being a reception. Okay, so to ensure prompt service. The district court granted summary judgment for the defendant, and the case was affirmed on appeal. The court held that the mandatory service charge was not a tip and could lawfully be used to offset the employer's uh, wage obligations under the FLSA. As, as an ancillary matter, I thought this was kind of interesting. Each party would for sanctions against each other, which the court rejected outright um, and said that damages and costs, it, it's not appropriate. Well, what they tried to do is uh, have an award for damages and costs when an appellant raises clearly frivolous claims, claims when the law is established and the facts are clear, but it hadn't been decided in that jurisdiction yet. So it, they just kind of were fighting back and forth. A lot of fighting going on. Are we doing on time? Good. Just found out. You got that 10 minutes. I'm trying to go as fast as I can. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is a case that was a really, really interesting case. Uh, the U.S. District Court of Eastern Division of Missouri decided February of this year. This has to do with a Hardy's restaurant that's in Amman, Jordan. And this was tragic that happened. But there was the plaintiff's five year old son was playing on the playground attached to this Hardy's and apparently touched a live wire coming from the ceiling and was immediately electrocuted and died. No one saw how the accident actually happened and an investigation took place and there was actually some criminal charges brought against some of the defendants who were managing the restaurant. But the defendant CKE is the parent company for several restaurant brands, including Hardee's. CKE has no direct license agreements with franchisees. Defendant Hardee's Food Systems, which is wholly owned by CKE, provides management services for the Hardee's brand. So they have this structure here. Defendant Hardee's Restaurant, also owned CKE, also owned by CKE, is the franchisor for Hardee's Restaurant franchises. A lawsuit was filed in July of 2017 with three causes of action uh, for this wrongful death. One was direct negligence and vicarious liability. The second was apparent authority. And last was strict liability for breach of warranty. So as to the last two counts, the court said Jordanian law would apply, and since Jordan doesn't recognize these types of these theories as a matter of law, they threw those two out. So the plaintiff's argument, um, well, in saying that the plaintiff's argument for parent authority relied on the use of the Hardy's name and logo, and that the restaurant was not advertised as having an independent ownership. The court said that the mere fact that a franchise or a sign appears on a building and employees are wearing a uniform with their logo doesn't mean a franchisee has apparent power to act on the, on the franchisor's behalf. The court granted summary judgment um, for the defendants on count one. The focus was whether the defendant had control or the right to control the daily operations of the franchise, stating that the license agreements containing certain standards were there to ensure the uniformity and protection of the franchisor's brand. That doesn't necessarily mean the franchisor is, um, has control over the daily operations. The defendants didn't have the power to hire or fire employees or to determine their wages. So there's no, the court said there's no direct or vicarious liability that can be imposed upon the defendants. And then the, the lower court's decision was affirmed on appeal. And I have another franchise case, which has to do with a Subway restaurant. 
Okay, so another case, this was done in, this is a Court of Appeals in Ohio that was decided in September, September 16th of this year. So I'm getting them right off the press, right off the press. Shelly Toff and her friend were in the uh, Subway restaurant heading toward the register when a raw iron unsecured display case fell on her and hurt her leg and her foot and her ankle. She sought a negligence claims against the defendants for failing to warn customers of, um, that this display rack might fall. And in her affidavit, from the lead counsel for Franchise World Headquarters LLC, which is the name defendant, Subway Restaurants LLC is not affiliated with restaurant in any capacity. It's not the owner, the um, operator, or the franchisor. Because there's a middleman in there. The franchisor of the Subway sandwich chain is in the U.S. is DAL. Subway Restaurants LLC provides services in connection with Subway franchise system and the brand. But each Subway restaurant is independently owned and operated pursuant to a franchise agreement executed between DAL and the franchise business. So in the event, um, Subway, uh, the, this appellee who is the uh, Subway Restaurants LLC is not a part of the franchise agreement. The court just said the plaintiff sued the wrong party. Probably on any pockets theory, who knows, but the lower court ruled in favor of the defendant. And on appeal, the plaintiff argued that Subway had apparent authority over the restaurant due to the use of the logos and other kind of argument about using the logos. And the court said that the display of trademarks by an independent franchisee business does not automatically create an agency relationship as a matter of law. So the lower court's decision in favor of the, uh, the, the Subway LLC was affirmed. Um, so that was kind of a very similar case, but interesting, I thought. Okay. All right, this is intentional uh, infliction of emotional distress. Bless you. All right, this case, there are multiple actions by the plaintiff. Uh, it took me a while to get through all these various lawsuits that were going on by the plaintiff against her employer, which used to be a Wood Springs Hotel property, and now it's Nationwide Hotel Management. And it was heard in the Middle District of Georgia on March of last year. Dorothea Joyner alleged that her direct supervisor and another management level employee spread rumors throughout the workplace and the corporate office saying that she had slept with her boss in order to become a GM. She said that was never true. She never had an affair with him. She completely denied it. Uh, there were some performance issues with her, so they placed her on an employment performance improvement plan. They told her they could evaluate her on April 10, 17, and 26, but she just wasn't cutting it, so they terminated her on April 7, so even before she was going to be evaluated. She said she put in extra effort at her job prior to April 7, but had she known she was going to be terminated early, she would have she would not have performed so efficiently. Good employee. The performance improvement plan stated that defendant hotel company had the right to end the employment relationship at any time during the improvement plan process. And an earlier claim by the plaintiff for sexual harassment was thrown out. Uh, plaintiff's initial fraudulent misrepresentation claim failed because plaintiff didn't show any detrimental reliance. She just had all these multiple claims and she just, she had no economic injury, so she just was not, uh, she wasn't going to win on any of these. The court said that liability is only found when the conduct is for uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. It's only found when the conduct is so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable and civilized community. The plaintiff claimed oh, these occurrences caused her multiple stress and anxiety and she cried daily. But she never went to a doctor. She never saw medical treatment for this. They noted that the infliction of emotional distress requires extreme conduct so severe that no reasonable person could expect it to endure it. And here she didn't have any evidence. She had nothing to show that. There was no physical manifestation, manifestations of her stress about the crime, and um, there was no treatment. So given the absence of this evidence, uh, the court just granted summary judgment for the defendant. I know I'm hurrying. That guy has to tell me something. So uh, uh, Diana, she also appealed it three times and lost at every level. And every level, exactly. She just, a lot of, I mean, a lot of how she knows that. Because <laughs> she's smart? You know, if, no, I, no. <laughs> that was your case? Oh, man, we had to talk. It's weird, but you're, it's just weird. Yeah, it's, it's just weird. Now we know how we feel, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Okay. All right, so here is um, 
The plaintiff here, this was in Tunica, Mississippi. Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Fifth Circuit was, uh, was decided February 11th of this year. The plaintiff and her husband checked into their room at the Miranda Hotel in Robinsonville, Mississippi. And the next day, they noticed a rubber bath mat in the tub. Since the mat looked fine, she, the, the plaintiff stepped into the tub, but when she placed her second foot on the mat, it slid all the way to the front where the water drains, causing her to fall uh, and, and injuring her sh shoulder. She filed a premises liability case against the defendant, alleging that she fell because the hotel staff put a mat down into the tub without making sure that the little suction things were stuck, and so that was her fault. She, didn't, she did not allege that the mat was defective, only that they put it in there and they didn't make it stick. Since she didn't show any evidence of the hotel's negligence, the district court granted summary judgment to the defendant. And the court using Mississippi law said that the plaintiff was a business invitee and that the hotel owed her a duty of reasonable care, stating that although business owners are not insurers of safety of the invitees, they must maintain their premises in reasonably safe condition. The plaintiff claims negligence because the hotel staff didn't secure the suction section cups. Uh, the court said hidden dangers can create a jury question, but only when the condition is not one that a person would normally encounter, like a bath mat. I mean, you gotta expect a bath mat may not be stuck. Mississippi courts have never held that placing an intact bath mat inside the tub would be a, neg a negligent act. However, one case, there was one case that came up where a hotel guest was injured. She um, showed the bath mat, it, it was placed by the guest, not by the hotel. And they had twisted somehow and caused her to slip, but that was placed by the hotel, not by, by, by the guest, not by the hotel. So they distinguished that case. The court granted summary judgment to the hotel, noting that the plaintiff didn't offer any proof of what caused her fall. The claim that hotel staff had properly secured the mat in the tub is just mere speculation. Okay, I'm moving very quickly now. Earlier we talked about signs. Um, to warn people, didn't we? We did. Okay, this seems like it's been a long time ago. All right, so in this particular case, this was in the Supreme Court of Louisiana, uh, December 10th of 2021. This woman was coming to the front desk, Cindy Perry. She's walking across the lobby in this new hotel, Monte Leon, and she slipped on something. I mean, some foreign object that was on the marble floor, and she hurt herself. The surveillance video of the scene showed a hotel employee driving off in the lobby around 8.36 p.m., about three minutes before the plaintiff incurred her injuries. Two wet floor signs were placed in the area. At 8.37 p.m., about one minute before the fall, two more wet signs, wet floor signs were added to the area. The plaintiff stated in her testimony that she had to walk around the signs because there was no other path to get where she was going to the front door. She thought the signs were just chalkboards and she didn't read them. <laughs> and the reason why is because they were made of wood and brass. They weren't your typical yellow or you know orange traditional wet floor signs. Um, so believing that these were questions of fact, the lower court denied the defendant's motion for summary judgment, and the, the uh, defendant applied for a supervisory review of the judgment, and the Court of Appeals denied the writ, then went to the Supreme Court of Louisiana, it granted cert to consider the correctness of the lower court's ruling. And Louisiana the law provides that a merchant owes a duty to exercise reasonable care to keep the aisles passing away before it's in reasonably safe condition, very typical. And the plaintiff had the duty to show that the merchant failed to exercise this reasonable care. When reviewing the surveillance tapes, the signs contained the words caution. These were the wooden signs with brass. I mean, they went all out on these signs. Brass and wood, and on the brass it says caution wet floor at the top, and it's also in Spanish at the bottom. Uh, and then there's also a picture of somebody falling in a um, triangle, you know, like a beware kind of thing. Yeah. That was also on the brass. But she didn't read the signs. Uh, four of these signs were placed in the lobby before she fell. The plaintiff said she didn't see the signs because she was weaving in and out. Um, that's undisputed. So her failure to read the sign was a doing of her own inattentive, inattentiveness, attentiveness, and the result of those health failures to take reasonable precautions. Summary judgment for the defendant. All right, we're getting close to the end. How much time? Last case. <gasps> you can't talk about Spanish. Choose wisely. Okay. Georgia, a couple years ago, enacted a law. Um, it's called the, what is it called? It's name. Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act in Georgia. 
None of the states have these laws as well. I've got just two really quick cases. Two really quick cases, both in Georgia, both decided this year. Very similar facts. Um, and we'll, go, we'll do this one. All right, in June of 2017, when the plaintiff was a minor, she and her and another child were sex trafficked at a hotel. The law there says that if you benefit in any way from sex trafficking, you don't do anything about it, don't try to stop it, but you're going to liability. Similar to how someone who's selling liquor uh, with their liquor license or somebody, you know, said gets into an accident with a third party, that kind of thing. But there's, since they're benefiting from selling the liquor, then they have some exposure and liability. So she, um, she said during her stay, she exhibited numerous well-known and visible signs common to minor sex trafficking victims, including that this is things that the hotel staff uh, was able to see. They could tell her age, her appearance, her physical deterioration, her poor hygiene, fatigue, sleep, no eye contact, loitering, etc. She said at least 15 men visit her, her hotel room, which was near the hotel lobby, and on two occasions, five adult men had sex with her at the same time. Plaintiff states stated that uh, she had direct contact with employees of the hotel on at least two occasions. One time she bought a box of condoms from one of the hotel employees. Another time she was locked out of a room with her minor child roommate um, and she went to the front desk to get a key and the front desk employee called the sex trafficker to get permission to let the girls back in the room. Plaintiff also alleges that the hotel had rented the rooms to the trafficker in the past. It was a history of it. Both these cases are very, very similar. Bad things are happening. Um, and the defendant in Iron and the Swedes, which was this one, filed several motions to dismiss, and the court ruled in favor of the plaintiff denying these motions to dismiss. So these things are becoming more and more common. And, and uh, I understand Florida may have some similar law to this as well, but these things are becoming more and more common. And we just need to really stay on top of it and do training and get people to stop doing this kind of activity um, and do the preventative things that are so necessary. To Genius, thank you very much. <laughs> she and her compadre, Karen Morris, out of Buffalo, New York, do a fabulous job every year bringing these cases to everyone's attention. So please be sure you take a look at that. And I'm sorry we didn't have a dram shop case in there, but I got plenty we can talk about it over a beer or something if you're interested. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that, that, that brings us to a close. And I appreciate everybody.